Today we're in chapter 10, Romans. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21. So allow me to read to you out of uh, Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 14. I'll read to verse 21, and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 21. And we're looking at confessing and believing. Paul writes in Romans 10, 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will anger you by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest. To those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, in order to introduce this, I need to remind you of what Paul has been saying in the verses previous to this, verses 9 through 13. In verses 9 through 13 of Romans chapter 10, Paul had made it very clear concerning the gospel that the gospel is a message that is open to both Jew and to Gentile. In other words, this gospel message that Paul is speaking concerning is not a message that is restricted to a certain geographic location, but is intended to be received by all. It's a message that's to go out to the whole world, like it says in Mark 16, 15, where we read, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the message of the gospel was not intended to remain in Israel, but to go throughout the world, which is one of the reasons why I'm blessed to know that, that our, our young people who went to, uh, to uh, Costa Rica and just returned, this high school group um, just returned, uh, ha- have taken that seriously. And they, they took the message, and they actually went on a foreign mission. And for those in high school to have such a heart is a blessing to me. And they will be sharing, some of them will be sharing this upcoming Wednesday uh, uh, concerning what the Lord has done. But, but the gospel is intended to go out. And so the gospel message is intended to go out to the whole world. Now, as we look at the gospel message and taking it a little further, the gospel message is also referred to as the word of faith. You saw him mention that in verse 8 here in chapter 10 when he says, the word is near you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. Uh, Unfortunately, in recent history, there are those who are speaking of this word of faith as if it was something that uh, referred to a word that was was uttered that produced certain results. Uh, That kind of teaching introduced magical incantations into Christian faith. When he speaks concerning the word of faith, that's just another way of speaking of the gospel. It's a gospel that is speaking of faith and faith in Jesus Christ. Paul uses that phrase in 1 Timothy 4, 6, when he says to Timothy, a young pastor, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. And so... Paul is speaking concerning the gospel, also referred to as words of faith. Notice what he said in verse 9 when he said, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That message of God raising Christ from the dead is found in in the gospel. And he says you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and that results in salvation. So he's speaking about an actual attitude of faith and and reception of this message of the gospel. So he says we're to confess the Lord Jesus. When he says confess, that word confess means we say the same thing. And so as a community of believers regarding who Jesus is, we're in agreement that he's the savior of the world. Now, confessing Jesus is more than simply saying something like, well, I believe in God or I believe in Jesus or, 
or even, oh, I'm a Christian already. There are so many who say that. I said that, and probably most, if not almost all of us in this room, would have said the same thing before we were saved. If somebody would have approached me and would have said to me, which they did, that I needed to receive Christ, my response immediately was, I'm already a Christian. That was my response, even though I didn't have a true faith in Christ. I didn't really regard him as my personal Lord and Savior. I hadn't been born again, but, but I would argue that. I was like so many others. And so confessing Jesus Christ is more than simply saying, I believe in him. It's much more than simply saying, well, I am already a Christian. Now, there are those who think that we as Calvary chapels may, may uh, dumb down the gospel and, and uh, make the, uh, the gospel message watered down by, by encouraging people to come to faith in Christ and, and to pray and to receive Christ. I received a, uh, a message just this last week where an individual writing me said, uh, Calvary Chapel has done a great work and an injustice, causing thousands to have a false assurance of sal salvation by telling them that they are saved by repeating a prayer. That's not what we teach. That's not what the Bible teaches. We don't say that if you say a prayer, it's like a magical incantation. I say these words and thus I'm saved. That's not what we say at all because the Bible doesn't teach that. We know that salvation is a life that, that uh, is reflected by a sacri sacrificial devotion to Jesus Christ. It's not just an intellectual agreement with certain things that, that, that they've read in the Bible. We know that there are people who, who could intellectually believe that what Jesus said is true, but that doesn't mean they embrace by faith what Jesus said. We see an example in John 12, 42 and 43, where John writes, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And so intellectual assent to certain things that are presented doesn't make you a Christian. The Bible teaches very clearly that you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. And if that actually is true, then your life is going to reflect that. There will be a transformed life. And so genuine Christians will exhibit several qualities that will identify them as, as actual believers in Christ. One of those things would be, would be obedience. Obedience to what God has to say. An individual who says that they're a Christian but doesn't obey the word of God Ought to, ought to begin to, to wonder whether they really know who he is. Jesus said, if you love me, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In Luke 6, 46, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Obedience is simply part and parcel of being a Christian. You read the word and you say, God, help me to obey this. My heart's desire is to do what you say. When we're looking at Romans chapter 6, verse 17, Paul said, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You obeyed from the heart. And so obedience is one of the earmarks of a believer. A love for God and a love for men, an earmark of the believer. Jesus said, a new commandment give I unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So love for God and love for one another is a demonstrating fact that we have a relationship with God. In 1 John 4, 20 and 21, John said, If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. And so obedience to the Lord, love for God, love for man, sacrifice. Sacrifice is an earmark of a believer. Jesus in John 15, 13 said, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so obedience, love, sacrifice, this all is worked out in what is called personal holiness. The Bible in 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And then there's the commitment that you have to Jesus Christ as the only Savior. See, when I got saved, I didn't add him to some kind of uh, group of people that I admired. I didn't just bring Jesus along and put him next to Buddha or some philosopher. I, I knew that he was the one and the only Savior. There's nobody else that I would look to. Greater than Moses, greater than Abraham. 
that he was the one and only Savior. And that's what constitutes a, a faith in Christ. In John 6, 67 through 69, Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We've got nowhere else to go. We're going to remain with you. And then finally, another earmark of a believer is that they have a hunger for the word of God. And this is one of the ways that you can take your spiritual temperature right now. You can do an inventory. Are these qualities of your life? And, and is there an overriding desire in your heart for the word of God? Hunger is always a good demonstration that there's life. And hunger for the word of God is a great demonstration that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Anybody who gets married knows that in order to have a good marriage, you have to have communication. There needs to be a relationship between the husband and the wife. I remember one famous actress whose husband lived in Japan, and she lived in the States, and she said, we've got a great marriage. I'm sure they, I'm sure they did. They never saw each other. But people who are, people who are married understand that the closer you get, the more conflicts you deal with because you get to know one another in a better and more intimate way. That's just the way it is. And so the best relationships are the ones that are, that are personal and there's a lot of communication. And so in, in a relationship with God, the word of God is what gives you life and that's why you hunger for it. I have a, a granddaughter who just celebrated her first birthday on Friday. And um, Stella, she turned one year old. And Stella will let you know that she's hungry. I mean, if you walk by with some yogurt, forget it. It's hers. I mean, that's just the way it's going to be. She is going to make some noise. She's going to get upset. She's going to grunt. I mean, just the other day, I walked in the den. As I've got this yogurt, I can hear this, rrr, 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 and it was Marie. And, and Stella's even worse. <laughs> Stella's even worse. But I know she's alive. How do I know she's alive? A variety of reasons. But one of them, quite obviously, is she's hungry. She needs to be fed. And that's a sign of life. And there's this hunger for the word of God that demonstrates that you have a relationship with God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, As newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So there's this hunger that we ought to have that demonstrates that even as babies are hungry for their mother's milk, we ought to be hungry for the nourishment that comes through the word of God. And all of these things are more than simply saying, Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, or yeah, I believe in God. These are earmarks of a believer. They have these things that really constitute the reality of their salvation. And so the Bible is very clear about that. And Paul, when he was speaking in verses 11, 12, in chapter 10 here, had said the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And so these are people who can put their trust in God's promises and they know that God is going to keep them. And he finally had said in verse 13 that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And God wants all to come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. All. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, Paul said it like this. God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. So Paul has been speaking concerning salvation, how we can have salvation, how we confess the Lord Jesus Christ, cling to him, and our lives are transformed. And this applies to both Jew and Gentile. So in verse 14, here in Romans chapter 10, he continues by saying, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So what is God's method of bringing salvation to people? Salvation comes as a result of people hearing the message, believing it, and then taking it out and communicating it to other people. And that's how they are not only saved themselves, through the preaching of the word, but that's how other people are saved. Now, not every person who comes to church is, is interested in salvation. There are people who come to churches, this church and others, uh, w with a spirit that is not necessarily open and receptive. I mean, a lot of people come to church because their parents make them come to church. 
They come to church for a variety of reasons, but it's not always so that they can receive from the Lord and grow as a believer. Sometimes they may come with some hostility and argumentative hearts. We had somebody in this church a while back now who had a friend who was um, just far from God, and so he began sharing the gospel with his friend. His friend didn't want to hear anything about the gospel, didn't want to hear anything about Jesus and all, and, and would argue with him. Now, the friend that he was speaking to was a, a, a gangster. He was in a gang, and, and was pretty involved in it. That was his life, pretty violent. And so when this young man would share with this friend who was so opposed to Christ, the friend would continually rebuff him, say, I don't want anything to do with that. So finally, one day, this young man speaking to him said, listen, why don't you just come to church in here for yourself? And this other guy said, no, I'm not going to go. Why would I go there? I don't want to go. And so his friend says something like, why are you afraid? Well, you don't say that to this guy, you know. What do you mean afraid? Um, what am I afraid of? Are you afraid of the truth? What do you, what? Now I'll go. So he came. And he brought some people with him, and they came to a church service. And he came to prove me to be an idiot. That's why he came. He came to argue. He came angrily to prove how stupid I am. And the claims that I'm making are all foolish. That's why he came. And so at the invitation, he got saved. He came walking forward and stood up and gave his heart to Christ. His name is David Trujillo. David Trujillo pastors Calvary Chapel, South Los Angeles now. But that's how David got saved, by coming, even with this argumentative spirit. That's how he came. He came with this, I don't need this. This guy's a fool. He's an idiot. Now he's a bigger fool than I am. And praise God for that. <laughs> Amen. Praise God for that. And so the gospel goes out. It's intended to go out. And people need to hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How then shall they call on him? On him? in whom they have not believed. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So there needs to be evangelism. You see, when you're saved, you have a responsibility now to give this message to other people. This message of salvation isn't for some elite group. And this communication of this message isn't for certain individuals. We may not all be evangelists. We may not all be missionaries. But we are all to be as witnesses. And we take this message and we share it. You can share it with your friends. You can share it with your family. You can share it with neighbors that you might have a relationship with that you can speak to, co-workers or people you go to school with. You can share this message. He says in verse 15, how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And so there's the sending. You see... The Lord can send you. He can commission you. This is one of those things we all can do. There's something in Scripture. It's referred to as the Great Commission. All of us who have been believers for a while are familiar with that term. And if I were to say, where is the Great Commission found? Many would say, oh, it's found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Because that's normally the passage of Scripture that is used to communicate what is called this great commission. But the fact is, this great commission isn't found just in one gospel. It's found in all four gospels plus the book of Acts. So you can see elements of the great commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You can see the command that Jesus gives to go out and preach the gospel to every creature in Mark 16, 15. You can see Jesus speaking concerning this in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 through 48. And you can also see it in John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. Finally, you see it wrapped up in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so this commission is a general commission, but it also was specific in the life of the apostle Paul. Paul had a commission that he'd received from the Lord. In Ephesians 3, verse 8, he said, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he had a commission, this commission to go. How shall they preach unless they are sent? 
Now notice in verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. And so the validity of their message, the authority upon which they act, is the Lord sending them out, taking this message, living this message, and giving this message to others. But, verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? National Israel is what he's referring to, and national Israel overwhelmingly rejected the Messiah. A Messiah that is clearly presented in Scripture. In so many different places, Isaiah 53 being but one. But they had, as a nation, rejected. In John chapter 12, verses 37 and 38, it says, even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And so he's speaking of the fact that the nation is rejecting. But he goes on in verse 17 of, of Romans 10 by saying, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Preaching is basic. God could line up the stars if he wanted in such a way that anybody could look and read Jesus saves in their own language. He could do that. It's not beyond him. But he chose not to do that. He chose to give a message called the gospel that through the foolishness of the message preached, people would be saved. A message that speaks of God, of God who loves, a God who gave, a God who is so holy he cannot look upon sin with pleasure, a God who is so just that he has to deal with it, a God who is so loving that he's willing to pay the price himself through Jesus Christ, his son, a God who's so gracious that he provides with, to, for us this, this unmerited favor to be saved, and a God who is so clear that he gives a message of salvation that you can hear, and by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, your heart can be touched and moved and transformed when you, by faith, commit yourself to him. In 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5, Paul said, My message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. In John 6, 63, we read, The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. The very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So stories are great. I like to use them. They're great jokes and humor. That helps us. Entertainment, that's something that's okay. Testimonies, those are things that you find in, in churches, and all of that can be part of a service. But none of those things by themselves will change a human life. The only thing that changes lives is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of the gospel to transform and so that's what he's speaking about. Who has believed our report? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But, verse 18, I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The Jews had heard the gospel. The book of Romans was written somewhere around 25 years after the birth of the church. So the nation of Israel had opportunity through Christ's ministry as well as the preaching of the gospel from the day of Pentecost. The nation of Israel has had an opportunity to hear this message, and yet they've closed their ears to it. When you read the book of Acts, the book of Acts is filled with information concerning their efforts at evangelism. But you see in the book of Acts a constant rejection of this message called the gospel. They had the chance to hear but they themselves did not receive. So Paul, in context, would be referring to the nation of Israel that has turned their ears away from the gospel. But at the same time, he's making it very clear that the word of God has gone out. Like he said again in verse 18, their sound has gone out to all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. God's word still goes out, by the way, to the ends of the world. Marie and I, my wife and I, had the opportunity of going to Mexico a week and a half or so ago, as some of you know. 
And we were given the opportunity to go. I was actually asked by a friend of mine, Mike McIntosh, to go and to teach at a pastor's conference and to teach at a Bible institute. So we flew into Mexico City. I've only been to Mexico City once in my entire life. I have stopped over in Mexico City to go to other places, but I've never really spent much time in the city itself. So for me, it was a new experience. And so we flew into Mexico City, and then we got in on a Wednesday. On Thursday, I went to a Bible institute, and I was teaching a a group of of students in this classroom that held around 60 people. And as I was there sharing a couple of studies with these students and all, when we finished teaching, Mike following and taught two studies, I turned to my host who was walking with me and sharing with me and just there for us. I, I said to him, is this where you meet on Sunday mornings? And he said, oh, no, we have another place that we meet on Sunday mornings. Now, you have to understand what I was thinking at that time. I've, I've seen a number of churches throughout, you know, uh, Mexico, South America, and all, and, and uh, they're not normally very large, and so there was a seating for around 60 people and, or so, and I thought, well, maybe this is where you meet on Sunday mornings. So I said to uh, David, my friend, I said, uh, is this where you meet? And he said, oh, no, we have another place. I said, can I see it? He said, of course. So we go walking down some steps and all, and we make it to these doors. I walk in the doors, and the, and the sanctuary seats 2,300 people. It's, it's huge. And I'm standing there at a sea of chairs, and I said, this is where you guys meet? He says, oh, yeah, we have double services. You have double services here? I, am, I'm, I said, forgive me. I am not used to seeing something like this. He says, oh, yeah. And so the pastor of this church, it's a horizon, Mexico City. The pastor's name is Fermin. That's not a name that that I'm familiar with. Some of you perhaps might be Fermin IV. Well, it turns out that Fermin was the number one rapper in Mexico. He is in Mexico. He is historically the greatest rap, uh, rap star that they have. Now, me... What do I know about rap? Yo, that's about it. I mean, I don't know. Yo, dog. I mean, there's really, I don't. Anyway, for shizzle. You know, I, I don't, I really, I, I don't know anything about it, my, my dizzle. I, I mean, that is not my thing. So what do I know? Well, this guy is huge still. I mean, he doesn't even do music anymore of that sort. But people still approach Fermin, and they want his autograph and pictures with him. He's huge in Mexico. He's the pastor. And so he's got about four to 5,000 people showing up. These people who are coming to this particular church, there's no parking. They park throughout this area. And if you're familiar with Mexico City at all, in this particular area, it's industrial, there's no street parking. They actually have to park blocks away. And you're talking about two services. You're talking about 2,300 people per service who are parking on streets all around this place and then making their way in to church. I was absolutely blessed and blown away by what God is doing in Horizon and to make friends with Fermin. And he's just a great guy, gentle spirit. I wouldn't know that he had a song that says, we're armed, and, and we're going we're to take over. He was violent and was, like they said, he is, he is Mexico's equivalent to M&M. Now, I like M&Ms. <laughs> the red ones are good. I like the blue ones. So, <laughs> he's the Mexican equivalent, the most famous of all rap stars. And he got saved, and he's pastoring this church. And one of the members of his worship team is a woman named Maria Del Sol. Some of you may have heard of her. She is one of the most famous actresses and their form of Broadway and singers in Mexico. Very famous. So we're hanging around with two people. I don't even know how, how impressive they are to everybody. They're just brother and sister in the Lord. And so we go to church on Sunday morning. And afterwards, Benjamin wants to take us out to eat. So he takes us to this place, Hacienda. And as he takes us, we're sitting there. And I had shared earlier, uh, a few days before, with a a, a brother. And I had said something, you know, just kind of talking. 
And I said, you know, when I was growing up, as, as I've mentioned here in this church, I said, my dad had a favorite group called the Trio Los Panchos, and, and I grew up hearing their music, and I had shared that with him. And he goes, oh, really? I said, yeah, one of my dad's favorite songs that I can still remember was a, a song called Malagueña Salerosa. And so I shared that. I grew up hearing that. That's what I heard. Every Saturday, my dad would play this music. So I heard this, right? And so I just mentioned, I said, that's a song that reminds me of my dad. And I just mentioned that. So we're in a hacienda, and we're eating. Very nice meal, I must confess. I miss it. And uh, <laughs> it was so good. So at, as we're eating... <laughs> As we're eating, I don't notice that a trio, they have mariachis that are going throughout the area, I don't notice that they came and stood behind me. I was too busy concentrating on that <laughs> plate in front of me. It was so good. And all of a sudden, I hear the opening sounds of Malagueña Salerosa. And they start to sing beautifully. And then I look, and right across from me on my right is Maria del Sol, one of the most famous artists in all of Mexico, and she's singing Malagueña Salerosa to me. And I start to cry. I start to cry. I was so overwhelmed. As I am right now. I am. I miss that food. <laughs> it, was, it was so good. Anyway, uh, I feel called. But anyway, uh, I mean, can you imagine that? And Fermin, this very, very well-known guy, is there right across from me. And after they finished singing, I was so overwhelmed, I, I couldn't even, even, I couldn't eat for two minutes. <laughs> and these mariachis are there getting their pictures taken with Maria del Sol. And the Spirit said, it's because the gospel left Jerusalem. It left Jerusalem. It went into Judea. It went into Samaria. It went throughout the world. So that one day, I would be sitting, not for this reason, but the, part of the results, that I would be sitting in a restaurant in Mexico City with people that I would never have known in my life, well known, one of them singing to me and the other one buying my meal. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> the gospel goes out. It's supposed to, isn't it? It's supposed to. It's supposed to. It's supposed to hit your heart. It's supposed to be shared with others. It's supposed to leave your house. It's supposed to leave your neighborhoods. It's supposed to leave your job sites. It's supposed to leave your schools. It is, it's supposed to leave your state, your nation. It's supposed to go throughout the world. That's what the gospel does. And it changes lives from some angry gangbanger who shoots people and has been shot, who's now pastoring a church in South L.A., from some guy who sings gangster rap, hates the establishment, and now preaches in a church of several thousands of people. It reaches a, a woman who sings Broadway in Mexico and, 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 and is well-known, who sits across the table from somebody like me and sings a song that reminds me of my father. That's what it does. Changes lives. The sound has gone out, Paul says, but they haven't heard, they haven't believed. It's not that the, the gospel has no power, it's, it's that the people refuse to hear it. They reject it. But it's the power of salvation. And Israel had rejected. It's not because God has no power to save. It's because they rejected him. So what does God do? Does he give up? No. He says in verse 20, Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. So instead of him just giving up, what did he do? He took that message to the Gentiles. When you read the Bible, the nation of Israel 
is looked at in a different way than the nations around them, the Gentiles. The nation of Israel is looked at as having certain, certain favors with God, grace that God gave to them. It speaks about them having the, the prophets, the signs, the wonders, miracles. It's, it speaks concerning them having the, uh, the word of God. They also had the temple, the, the temple ceremonies. They had the priesthood. They had so many advantages. So when Israel is spoken of in the New Testament, they are not spoken in the same way that Gentiles are spoken of. Gentiles, who are non-Jews, are spoken of as the nations, the goyim, the nations. And the nations are spoken of in the New Testament as those who are without God, those who know not God. You see that, for example, in Ephesians 2, 12 and 13. At that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so Israel as a nation, national Israel, did not come to faith in their Messiah. God didn't give up. He reached to a nation or nations that weren't even seeking him. That's what he's saying here. I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. God sought them out the way God sought you out. The way God sought you out. God reached out to me and God reached out to you, didn't he? By the gospel. By somebody who loved you enough to tell you the truth. Somebody was willing to take the chance of you rejecting them and getting angry at them. But God reached out to you. You see that in Genesis when God, after the fall, says, Adam, where are you? You see it in the book of Revelation and everywhere in between where the spirit and the bride say, come. There's the invitations of God. All who would come to him, none will be rejected. God desires all men to know him, all women to know him and be saved. And so he reached out to those who didn't even have the desire, apparently, to reach out to him. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. He was ready and he was willing, but they are disobedient and they reject him. Jeremiah 25, 4 says, The Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. It's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and God still does. His voice is still crying in the wilderness of sin. Make a path to the Lord. Come to him. Israel rejected him. They were contrary and they were disobedient. But not all. Not all have rejected him. It's not that every Jew has rejected him. There are Jewish believers. We call them messianic believers. We used to call them completed Jews. They've come to faith in their Messiah. But as a nation, Paul is saying they have rejected their Messiah. Even though God has reached out to them and he's put his hand out and he has said, take my hand and be saved. Even though Jesus Christ wept over the city of Jerusalem and said, you need to come to me, how often I would have gathered you, even as a mother hen gathers her chicks underneath her wings, but you refused, you would not come. Yet the Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I praise the Lord that I called on his name and I was saved. I bless the Lord for every person in this room who's called upon the name of the Lord and been saved. But there are so many out there right now who have yet to call upon this name that they might be saved. And so, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Let us take this message out and share it with others. May we live it and may we give it that they might come to faith in Christ who loves them and gave his life for them.